Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Ecology and Management of Missouri's Woodland Communities with Mike Leahy and Susan Farrington. My name is Haley Howard and I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to Mike and Susan. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you on Monday, along with the resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for a little bit of background on Mike and Susan. Mike Leahy has a Bachelor of Science degree in Forestry from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and a Master of Science degree in Forestry from Missouri, Michigan State University. He has worked for nearly 30 years for state natural resource agencies. Currently, Mike is the natural community ecologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation. He lives in Jefferson City with his wife and son. Susan Farrington is a natural history biologist in the Ozark region for the Missouri Department of Conservation. Formerly, she was a community plant ecologist with the Missouri Ozark Forest Ecosystem. She spends much of her time restoring glades and woodlands in the Ozarks, leading prescribed burns and fighting the exotic invasive species that threaten our natural communities. We are excited to have Mike and Susan here today to share their expertise with us. And now I'll hand it over to Mike. Thanks, Haley. So in today's talk, it's gonna be in two parts and I will start the talk with an overview of the ecology of Missouri's woodland natural communities. And then my colleague, Susan, will then delve into how these natural communities are restored and managed. So first off, woodlands are a term coined by ecologists for fire adapted natural communities with a mature, mature tree canopy cover that ranges from 30 to 90%. In Missouri, these are typically drier wooded sites. They are characterized by the following features. These are often shorter stature trees, less than 80 feet tall for oaks with spreading often gnarled crowns. Typically the dominant tree species include post oak, chinkapin oak, black oak, and blackjack oaks and hickories, such as mockernut and black hickory, and shortleaf pine in some parts of the Ozarks. The ground layer is rich in summer and fall blooming wildflowers, such as in native grasses, and the native grasses can be both warm and cool season grasses. This is a key point, as you can see in this slide too, the understory is very open. So this mid-story or understory is it's primarily open that allows sunlight to the ground. And you do have scattered oak and hickory sprouts, but there is not a very thick understory. These sites are usually on south and west facing aspects. The soil is typically shallow and rocky, but they also occur on ridge tops with a fragile pan. And they do occur on some richer sites as well, but the, the fullest expression of these woodlands are typically on drier sites. And the sunlight is dappled at the ground surface. And a lot of the sunlight comes in from the sides, not necessarily from the open canopy. Post oak is a signature tree species of woodland natural communities in Missouri and throughout the US. And this map here shown from the US Forest Service, the higher densities of post oak as recorded in forest inventory and analysis plots are those that have the darker green and darker blue. And you can see that in Missouri, we have a predominance of post oak in the Ozarks, as well as scattered areas in North Central and Northeast Missouri with heavy post oak dominance. Many of the plant species that are characteristic of woodlands are also characteristic prairie plant species. This shows the linkages between these community types. Some of the species such as cream wild indigo shown here, occur both in prairies and in restored woodlands. Other species that are similar between these community types include lead plant, particularly in the Western Ozarks in our woodlands, finger coreopsis, rattlesnake master, and goat's rue. Other species that are common be between prairies and woodlands include compass plant, oh, sorry, rosin weed, which is related to compass plant in the same genus Sylphium, 
Bakun, and Rough Blazing Star. However, there are a number of ground flora species that are woodland specific. Some of these include Buckley's Goldenrod, Elm Leaf Goldenrod, Stiff Aster, and Butterfly Pea. A few others include Four Leaf Milkweed, Yellow Pimpernel, and Arkansas Bedstraw, shown here. Now, in the Ozarks, where most of our woodlands in Missouri occur, <clears throat> they're oftentimes associated with glade natural communities. And oftentimes, the two communities, glades and woodlands, occur in very complex mosaics. Glades are dominated by herbaceous plants and less than 10% uh, tree cover. And some biologists have called these xeric prairies because, like woodlands, and even more so, glades share many similarities in the herbaceous flora to our prairies. Glades are, like prairies and woodlands, fire-adapted communities. In the, in the absence of periodic fire, they typically get invaded by eastern red cedar and other woody vegetation. Glades and woodlands, like I said, are typically intermingled in the Ozarks, and some of the best opportunities in many places in the Ozarks to restore woodlands are in conjunction with restoring glades. This diagram shows a glade woodland to forest mosaic. So <clears throat> on the southwest facing aspect, on the left hand side of this diagram, we see a dry dolomite woodland below a glade. And then above the glade, and this is very typical in Missouri, you get a dry chert woodland with very churty soils above it. And then as you transition over that hill slope to the north and east aspect, there's often a dry mesic chert woodland there that has taller trees, but it still is a woodland community. But then as you go down the slope to the lower north and east facing slopes, you get more of a forest floor, and then eventually you'll get a true forest community. This diagram from Hahatanka State Park shows that in some places in the Ozarks, um, the landscape is riddled with glades. So in this diagram, we can see that glades are indicated by the dark green splotches on this topographic map. And this view shows a glade woodland complex in the Ozarks at Little Niagara River Natural Area in Camden County. And you can see how the glade <clears throat> in the foreground merges into, in the background, a dry chert woodland with scattered trees and a more open canopy. Here's another view of a glade woodland complex from Steagall Mountain Natural Area at Peck Ranch Conservation Area in Carter County, Missouri. And you can see the intermingling of the glades and woodlands together. This particular glade woodland complex is found on rhyolite rock, which is an ancient volcanic rock. Now, savannas are a related community type. In Missouri, ecologists define savannas as, ha as having 10 to 30% tree canopy cover. However, these natural communities are typically associated, at least historically, with prairies. And there was a historic gradient, somewhat shown here at Union Ridge Conservation Area, where we go from an open savanna into a closed, more closed woodland as you go down the slope. Now in savannas, the ground flora outside the drip lines of those trees is pretty much the same as a prairie. But underneath the drip line of those trees, the ground flora is that of a woodland. So you get a real complex intermingling of species. Now in today's landscape, savannas are very rare. Um, however, we have a lot of structural savannas, which are areas with scattered oak trees, but the ground is covered in either non-native tall fescue or Kentucky bluegrass or in North Missouri, in some cases, smooth brome. These don't um, have nearly the same uh, ecological attributes of true remnant savannas, which are very rare. Now in juxtaposition to these fire adapted communities, we have true forests in Missouri, which ecologists define as wooded communities where fire is not a dominant force. It may occasionally happen um, under cool conditions with backing fires, but it's not a force that um, drives this typical, this type of natural community. Forests are dominated and characterized by tall straight trees, um, often reaching over hundred feet in height, including white Northern red oak, um, white ash, basswood, sugar maple, 
um, slippery elm, bitter nut and shag bark hickories. True forests have a forest floor that is rich in spring ephemeral or wildflowers and ferns, but later in the season, there's often less blooming uh, going on in our forests than our prairies, woodlands, and savannas. And there's a thick midstory of shade tolerant shrubs and small trees, including dogwoods, spice bush, pawpaw, ironwoods, muscle wood, and sometimes serviceberry. These are typically found at north and east facing aspects with richer soils and they're in protected lower slopes, places that historically did not burn very frequently. And at summertime, there's a deep shade on the ground level. Forests have a number of characteristic species that typically only occur in forests. These include species such as maidenhair fern, white trillium, bellwort, and broadleaf goldenrod. Now, over the past few thousand years here in Missouri, our climate has been wet enough such that in the absence of fire, grasslands grow up into trees. So <clears throat> it's universally, excuse me, it's universally accepted now that Missouri's tall grass prairies were primarily fire maintained over the fast, past few centuries prior to statehood in 1821. These fires were also primarily set by Native Americans and later by early European settlers. However, during drought periods, lightning fires also occurred and shaped the land. In 1800, Missouri was covered with at least 15 million acres of prairie, and scattered prairies also occurred throughout the Ozarks as seen in this map. The fires that maintain prairies also influenced the woods. Dendrochronology and fire history work by Rich Guyette and Mike Stambaugh of MU document fire scars in the wood of old growth trees and ancient pine stumps. These fire scars only document the fires that were hot enough to create a wound. So there were um, less intense fires that could have happened that were not recorded in the tree ring record. The fire intervals that they've sampled vary through time and space depending on the climate patterns at the time and human population densities in the early 19th century. They documented that in the Missouri Ozarks, between uh, be prior to European settlement, the mean fire interval ranged from three to 13 years. Historically, this influence of fire in combination with soil conditions and periodic droughts gave rise to a preponderance of woodlands across Missouri's Ozarks and the hiller, hillier lands of Northeast and North Central Missouri. At one time, woodland natural communities covered at least a third of the state. Even today, as much as 6 million acres of degraded woodlands still occur primarily in the lower Ozarks of Missouri. There are a variety of interesting historical quotes that describe the woodlands of the state. One that's very uh, often quoted is one from Henry Rose Schoolcraft in 1819 in the uplands near the Merrimack River, in which he wrote, a succession of hills of moderate elevation covered chiefly by oaks and without underbrush, a tall, thick, and rank growth of wild grass covers the whole country, in which the oaks are standing interspersed like fruit trees in some well-cultivated orchard and giving to the scenery the most novel, pleasing, and picturesque experience, or appearance, sorry. There are other quotes, such as from Joseph Mudd in 1888 in Lincoln County, Missouri, describing open woods <clears throat> um, that were burned annually by Native Americans, um, in which the trees were so far apart that, that hunters could see uh, deer at very long distances. There are other quotes um, from the General Land Office Surveyor records, too, that indicate that um, some woodlands had quite a bit of re-sprouts of um, oak and hickory, so these were not all completely grass covered. There was a mix. A number of biological adaptations of the species in our woodlands um, have adapted them to frequent fires. This includes shortleaf pine seedlings and saplings, which when are top killed by fire, sprout from re reproductive buds located in the basal crook, which is a unique root feature. Oak seedlings and saplings top killed by fire also readily re-sprout. In addition, the bark of both pine and the oaks help protect the cambium from fire damage. And the leaf litter of both oaks and the needle cast of the pine form a readily burned fuel bed in contrast to the leaf litter of more mesophytic species like sugar maple, red maple, and elm. And last, pine seeds 
and acorns also germinate best with low levels of leaf and needle litter, which is reduced by, again, fire. So these species tend to be fire adapted. The common denominator for our fire maintained woodlands, again, is a sparse understory of woody plants. This allows for dappled sunlight to reach the ground. The combination of dappled sunlight on the ground and the effects of fire promote the growth and flowering of a wide array of native grasses, such as sunflowers, asters, goldenrods, and many native legume species. Woodland restoration has clear benefits for native biodiversity. Research conducted by Calvin Maginel and others with MU and MDC at then Nature Conservancy's Chilton Creek site documented the results of annual and periodic prescribed fire on woodland sites along with control plots. This 16-year record shows that total ground floor cover increased 107% on annual and 144% on periodic burned plots and only 31% on control plots. These graphs also from the Chilton Creek study document the increase in cover of native grasses, forbs, legumes in those annual and periodic burn plots in contrast to the unburned control plots. This figure from Dan Dries with the Ozark National Scenic Riverways shows that after five burns, dry woodland plots increased in native herbaceous cover, I mean, sorry, native herbaceous species richness by 181%. I'm sorry, this graph is a little bit <clears throat> blurred. Dan had a really nice high quality graph, but when I imported it into PowerPoint, it got a little blurred, but it clearly shows that, that big increase in species richness in these burned sites. So woodland restoration promotes the ground floor as we've seen, which in turn supports abundant insects that has been documented. That in turn provides the primary food base for turkey poults, as well as other wildlife. Woodland restoration also restores a diverse and abundant ground flora that is utilized by many pollinators. Research has shown that woodland restoration assists with native bee conservation, as seen in these two uh, citations here. Restoration of oak woodlands and savannas has shown to benefit the diversity and abundance of native bees in comparison to unmanaged sites in research in Michigan and in shoreleaf pine oak woodlands of northern Louisiana. So far in Missouri, we've only had preliminary work done on the um, effects of woodland restoration on pollinator communities, but preliminary work shows that sites restored with either fire or fire and thinning so far had a greater native bee diversity and abundance than unmanaged sites. High quality woodlands support an abundance of ground layer plants that also serve as food for caterpillars of different Lepidoptera species, including the model dusky wing and the southern cloudy wing shown here. Now let's consider the case of the collared lizard population at Steagle Mountain. This species of conservation concern was introduced into the igneous glade system here between 1984 and 1989. At first, the collared lizard population grew slowly, but once prescribed fire was applied to the mosaic of glades and woodlands starting in the mid 90s, the lizards were able to steadily increase their population. The restored woodlands provide a greater visibility, sunlight, and a greater prey base of caterpillars, sorry, not caterpillars, grasshoppers, all of which benefited the lizard. The combined glade and woodland management led to a successful collar lizard introduction. The Central Hardwoods Joint Venture and the American Bird Conservancy have identified conservation priority bird species that utilize restored woodlands. These include the Eastern Wood Peewee, the Blue Gray Gnatcatcher, the Red-Headed Woodpecker, the yellow-billed cuckoo, and the eastern whippoorwill. And research by Frank Thompson and his students in Missouri have documented the positive habitat benefits of woodland restoration on both woodland generalist birds, such as the summer tanager, and early successional forest birds, not forest birds, but wooded birds um, that are species of conservation concern, including, uh, well, they're not listed species of conservation concern, but bird species of conservation interests such as the blue wing warbler and prairie warbler. And Jeff Brigler, our state herpetologist, has uh, listed the following species as benefiting from woodland restoration, including our two box turtles, a variety of skinks, and some lizard species as well as snake species. 
Now in the Ozarks in 1800, we had nearly 16, 6 million acres of shortleaf pine oak woodlands. These woodlands supported the now um, extirpated red cockaded woodpecker. And unfortunately, between 1880 and 1920, these old growth pine woodlands were unsustainably logged on an industrial scale. Following the logging was severe wildfires, overgrazing, and land clearing, which was then followed by fire suppression beginning in the 1940s, which resulted in many of these sites shifting from a pine dominated system to one dominated by scarlet oak and black oak. However, today in the Missouri Ozarks, the Mark Twain National Forest and other conservation partners have restored pine oak woodlands and recently reintroduced the brown headed nuthatch, which was formerly um, in these woodland systems. These two images contrast a restored on the east side of the road and an unrestored woodland on the west side of the road on the Mark Twain National Forest. And here's a similar panoramic shot from Lead Mine Conservation Area. This next series of slides result, shows the before and after results of restoration at Steagle Mountain Natural Area. And again, you can see that the result of years of prescribed fire resulted in a diverse and abundant ground flora. So in the next presentation, Susan will delve into the details of woodland restoration and management. <clears throat> and we will quickly pan through some images of woodlands here. Show the photo credits and I will turn my computer off and let Susan take over. Okay. Hang on one sec, I'm being a little slow here. I need to get my, uh, just one second. Ah, now ah, stop that and show. Okay. What the heck? Did I just, <laughs> sorry about that. Ah, I didn't have it as ready as I thought I had it. Okay, now I think I'm ready. Share the screen. And play that. And okay, but I'm there. We go. All right, are we all good to go? Can Haley? Can you let me know? Presentation notes aren't showing. Hopefully, you're good to go. Okay, welcome all. So yeah, uh, as Mike said, uh, Mike told you about what a woodland is. Well, I'm going to talk um, about what the majority of our woodlands are today, which is the majority are overgrown, thick set with too many trees. This is pretty typical of what most people's woodlands look like today. Small trees and brush create heavy shade and the ground is covered in leaf litter and woody sprouts. There are almost no fl flowers or grasses and very little food for wildlife. And this is kind of a typical look at most people's back woodlots. So um, this is an overgrown woodland at Foshi Creek prior to management. Note the tree with the red dot. Here is the same woodland after just one burn in the fall of 2005. It's pretty unusual for one burn to change an area that much, but it was assisted by some canopy loss due to an ice storm. In the summer of 2007, it was lush with wildflowers and grasses due to abundant sunshine. So when walking through your overgrown woodlands, look for the widespread branches of old oaks that indicate that they once grew in much more open conditions. You won't always find those open grown oaks though, as most of our woodlands, like Mike said, were cut hard around the turn of the last century. And then they were burned, free, given frequent burning to create forage for open range livestock. We began suppressing fires in the 40s, and most of our forested landscape today is now second and third growth. But if you live in the Missouri Ozarks within the range of shortleaf pine, look around for these old pine stumps. This was a very large pine at one time, cut around 100 years ago with a cross-cut saw. Frequent exposure to fire as they grew caused these old pines to exude a, a lot of resin, which serves as a wood preservative. So these old pine stumps are still solid. 
You can find well-preserved pine stumps of various sizes throughout what used to be the range of shortleaf pine. Often though, there are not many pines left in these woodlands because the oaks and hickories re-sprouted quickly after the heavy cutover. When the fire was suppressed, the oaks and hickories quickly shaded out any pines trying to regenerate. So how do we get from this to this? The more open structure that we expect to see in a woodland can be achieved by commercial harvest of some of the larger trees and or thinning of the smaller trees that crowd the over understory. However, be careful. If you thin heavily and introduce a lot of sunlight all at once, you'll see a tremendous woody sprout response. And in this picture, you can see a ton of oaks coming up. And oaks are good, but this many oaks, maybe not. So having some woody sprouts certainly doesn't worry me. As long as fire is kept in the system, they grow up and they get top killed back and forth and they provide habitat for shrub and edge birds such as prairie warblers. But what happens when we don't burn for a while because of other priorities and issues? This is a woodland pro restoration project after we had burned it just once, it was still very thick and shaded. So we decided to open it up with a commercial harvest and this is what it looked like after the harvest and the second burn, a little messy in that scene. So we followed up with some thinning and this is the same spot after thinning and a third burn. It had been opened up a lot. The herbaceous plant response was very good and the structure of an open woodland had been achieved. This was after a fourth burn and it was still looking really good. But then we didn't stick to the burn schedule and this is that exact same spot. 10 years had passed before burning it finally again. This was taken after the fifth burn. The woody sprouts had grown tremendously and the fire could barely penetrate in some of the areas. It's thicker now than before we began restoration efforts. So we learned a big lesson there. You can't walk away if you've burned it. If you have opened it up really wide, you have to stick to your burn schedule. So there are a couple of options to avoid that scenario. One is to use fire alone and patiently wait for it to open things up so that you don't introduce a ton of light into the system all at once. Burn every one, two, or three years as you can, and over time, more and more will open up without it becoming a sprout patch. This woodland on Nature Conservancy property was burned nearly every year for at least 15 years and is rich in woodland forbs with no management other than fire. And there's the woodland forbs. Many of our woodland grasses and forbs can perform very well in more canopy than you might think as long as the canopy is high overhead and there is limited shading closer to the ground. High dappled shade is actually a great recipe for woodland flowers and the pollinators that thrive on them. This is a mesic woodland that was burned this past March, so a more moist area. It has had no treatment other than several fires. The dappled light from the high canopy was sufficient to support a very rich assortment of plants. There are, excuse me, there are still some woody sprouts, which is good because eventually the canopy trees will need to be replaced. And those woody sprouts are our future canopy trees. But fire isn't for everyone. For those who either can't burn their woods or who likely won't burn them often enough, Another option is to do some thinning and treat each cut stump with an appropriate herbicide so that the stumps don't result in numerous re-sprouts. I would use a product with triclopyr as its active ingredient. Avoid Tordon, which is commonly sold as it has a reputation for traveling below the surface and damaging the roots of the trees that you want to keep. Um, using an applicator like the one shown ensures that you only put herbicide on the cut stump with a little or no personal contact and no collateral damage. This is a small patch of woods surrounding a rare sinkhole shrub swamp community. Young cedars and many other small trees were shading out the sun-loving plants around the pond. Our AmeriCorps crew did a light thinning where smaller trees were cut to allow the bigger trees more room to grow and to allow more sunlight to get to the ground. 
When thinning, we target maples, cedars, small hickories, black gum, Carolina buckthorn, elms, etc. Dogwoods and redbuds are gorgeous, but they can certainly be overly abundant, so we thin some of those as needed to help to let more sunlight in. We preserve pines, young oaks, and slow-growing service berries, which make the very first berries for birds and wildlife each spring. If you only use thinning to open things up, you'll likely need to follow up with additional thinning as time goes on. If you decide you want to do some burning, please keep in mind that using fires safely requires a lot of good preparation and some experienced help when you are getting started. A good start is to attend an MDC burn workshop. You can, you can contact your local MDC office and ask when the next workshop will be presented. There's an online portion of the training that you complete first at your leisure, and then you attend an in-person one-day practical exercise portion. No one wants their burn to get out and affect neighboring land or structures. I would advise extra caution, especially for your first burns. If you are careless, you can be held liable for damages if your fire gets out. But if you attend a burn workshop, you become certified. And as long as you follow an official burn plan for your property, a 2021 Missouri law releases you from liability if things don't go quite as planned, if it was unforeseen problems. Some areas have prescribed burn associations, bringing property owners together to assist one another with their burns and often providing necessary equipment for the burn. Consult your local private lands conservationist to find out what help is available in your area. Make sure you install good fire breaks. For starters, use a blower to blow the leaves into the adjoining, away from your fire line into the adjoining woods. Be sure to blow the, the leaves clear into the woods. Don't leave them piled up right by the edge of the fire break. Your fire line should be blown clear at least six to eight feet wide, more if it's on a ridge top steep, or on a steep hill, or if there's a lot of fuel piled up near the line. This is an example of a much too narrow fire line, barely two feet if that. We had several large spot fires during this burn since the line was too narrow. Move excess, excess fuel away from your fire line, particularly if it's sticking up in the air. I would move this very punky log that is right up against the line. Look for any dead trees known as snags near your fire line. How close is too close? Um, it depends on the height of the tree and to some extent, the landscape position of the line. A 50 foot tall dead tree 40 feet in from the line on a ridge top with the wind blowing across the fire line is much more likely to throw sparks across the line than a similar tree in a moist bottom with the wind blowing into, into the burn unit. But even if you expect the wind to be blowing into the unit, remember that a dead tree can burn for a couple days or more and the wind direction might be different a day or two after the burn. And one more word about snags. Obviously, they're important and valuable and necessary for lots of species, bird species and bat species, insects, etc. Um, so certainly we aren't trying to get rid of all the snags in the world, but if they're right next to your line, we certainly have to do something to address them. Well, and, and the fire might create new snags in the interior of the burn unit. So even a very small dead tree is a hazard if it's within a couple feet of the line, which is why this little one was cut down. You have two choices with a dead tree that's too close to the line. If you or someone else is able to safely cut it down, that's, that works great. But just be sure that the Sawyer is experienced and understands the hazards of cutting a dead tree that may or may not have sufficient holding wood to safely direct its fall. If you can't cut the dead tree down, you can also choose to mitigate it by clearing all fuel around the base. <clears throat> if I were to mitigate this snag, I would cut any sprouts near it and blow the ground clear all the way around it to a distance of at least five feet. I would either blow around or move that dead log next to it as that would burn for a couple days or more and sparks may carry upwards into the dead limbs of the snag from the, that log. 
So get rid of anything that will create something like a campfire underneath or near that tree. This large dead oak was very well mitigated. You can see how the fire burned all around it, but there was no fuel to burn directly under it and no dead logs or debris were left anywhere near it. This shows a small dead tree within a few feet of the fire line. The team that blew around it <clears throat> missed the opportunity to make it a much safer by detouring slightly and blowing the fire line all the way up to the dead tree. If you blow from the line out and around a nearby dead tree, anything, anyone igniting there has to go around the back of the tree. This is the safest kind of snag to mitigate, and it can be a big tree as it will only have fire at its back and the flame length at the fire line is short and more controllable. By contrast, a tree 20 or 30 feet in, but up a hill like a steep hill will have an increasingly strong and big flame coming toward it. And something like that would require very good mitigation. And no matter how well you mitigate a snag, it's still possible for it to catch a, a spark and set a limb on fire. And that's why when we can, we prefer to cut them versus mitigating. But we do, we do some of both with all of our trees on our, in our burns, both at home and also at MDC. Um, this is, it's especially likely that a limb would catch fire from a spark if the hum relative humidity is low and when it has been dry for a long period, allowing that tree to dry out enough to be much more flammable. So choose your conditions and don't burn when things are super dry. My husband and I do a lot of prescribed burning on our property. We prefer to burn between December and late February, and we burn later in the afternoon as the humidity is rising. This was the start of our burn last year, and you can see the sky, the sun already was. By contrast, at MDC, we usually start our burns around 9 or 10 a.m., and the humidity is falling until 2 or 3 p.m. We usually need to do that because we burn larger units that need the whole day to get around them, but we also have an adequate number of trained staff and equipment to handle any spot fires or issues. At home, I highly recommend you burn late in the day. The humidity will rise during the burn, creating a milder effect. Frequent mild burns are much better than one really hot burn. Don't be surprised if it burns into the night when you start late in the afternoon. As long as your lines are secure, you can go to bed knowing it's all good. Also keep in mind that nighttime fires look much more impressive than daytime fires. The smallest flame tends to look huge in the dark, so don't be alarmed by that. There's been a lot of discussion lately about the seasonality of prescribed fires. While I much prefer to burn during the dormant months of December through February, the reality is that it isn't always possible, depending on what your habitat is and what the weather is. A prairie burn is pretty easy to pull off in the fall or winter months. Grass dries out very quickly, and if you're burning warm season grass, you want to choose the mildest conditions possible. It might have poured yesterday, but you can still burn today because grasses dry out that quickly. Leaf litter though in a partially or heavily shaded woodland will take much longer to dry out. So if we're getting rain every few days, it can make it very challenging to find a window to burn. At MDC, we're burning larger units, often hundreds and sometimes thousands of acres. A landscape burn has both advantages and disadvantages to get around such a large area, we need a relatively long day and therefore find it difficult to burn such units in December, January, early February um, in that time period. On the other hand, when we do burn it, it is large enough that the fire takes a few days to, to punk around throughout the unit. That results in some areas perhaps getting a little hotter burns, but other areas getting a very mild burn, some areas not burning at all. So we get a mosaic, and unlike a small burn unit, we will typically leave some pretty large sections unburned or very lightly burned, and that provides refugia for any species that might not benefit from the fire, such as overwintering insects in plant stems. Um, there's always some give and take with fire, but we certainly want to do more good than harm. 
And every fire is different. And there are multiple factors that determine if a fire is severe or mild. These two burns pictured here were one day apart in mid-March of 2017. The first was mild on a day that started close to freezing with some overcast conditions, requiring us to watch and wait for a couple of hours for it to even carry. This was our test fire that we gave up on and turned into a campfire to keep ourselves warm until we could burn. The next day started sunny at 40 degrees and hit a record 88 degrees at the time at, uh, when I took this picture at, toward the end of the burn. It was one of the hottest burns I've been on and one day made all the difference in those two burns. So you have to take into consideration wind, temperature, relative humidity, seasonality, and moisture levels of the leaves and the down dead wood, they all contribute to the big picture. Consider all of those factors and make sure that no more than one of the factors is close to its allowable extent. For example, we could burn under relatively low humidity if the temperature was mild and fuels are somewhat moist, particularly if it's also the dormant season. If we burn in mid to late March, we need to be more mindful of all of those other conditions and make sure we don't burn when it's super low humidity, high temperature, high wind, etc. To do so, we can definitely burn it too hot. But I've also seen a very hot woodland burn in early December when drought made the fuels very dry and the temperature was pushing 75 degrees. And I've seen a fire conducted in late March in a very mesic habitat where spring wildflowers were in full bloom. Yet those same flowers re-sprouted and were blooming again a month later. All of the March burns in this particular unit were conducted under mild conditions, although I'm sure there were some hotter conditions on steep slopes such as this one. But the vegetation on this east facing slope in that unit was much lusher in April of 2017 after the burn than an unburned east slope just across ne next to the burn unit. Um, I don't like to simplify things by saying that it's fine to burn in December, but it isn't fine to burn in March. All of the factors of a burn need to be considered to ensure that your burn is ecologically helpful instead of harmful. So I hope I've left you with a few ideas on how to get started in opening up your woodlands to encourage the plant and insect diversity that Mike talked about. And uh, I'll leave it there for us to both take any questions you all have. All right, thank you so much. And we do have questions. So uh, let's go ahead and get to those. Uh, the first question that came in was from Jack. <laughs> And he wants to know if there's a rule of thumb on how much thinning should be done to keep a woodland healthy. I know you had mentioned, Susan, that over thinning could be an issue. So could you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, I saw when that question came in and um, it, it's hard to say, but basically you want to shoot for having, I like to thin from below to leave the um, canopy intact. Uh, mostly intact, and just remove some of the smaller species that are creating a lot of shade on the ground. Um, and, you know, I did mention in that one slide, the species we tend to target, and it's not that we only let oaks and pines live, we certainly let a diversity of species live, but, but if we're making choices of different species, the ones I named were the ones we would target first. Um, so yeah, open it up enough that you can see some good sunlight get down to the ground, but don't open it up so much that it's an abrupt shock and now full sun instead of dappled, dappled sun through the high shade. All right, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is from Matthew, and I believe that Mike be able might be able to answer this. Uh, is there a minimum size in order to classify a habitat as a glade? So there are some small pockets of glade-like habitats at Don Robinson State Park, but he was just wondering if there's a rule of thumb size for that. Well, yeah, there are some really small glade openings we call gladelets <laughs> that are, <laughs> you know, maybe 50 by 50 feet, but typically 
a quarter acre is kind of the minimum size and it depends on the, the community type. So like at Don Robinson, those are a lot of those glades are sandstone glades and they tend to be smaller naturally. Um, and some of those, a half acre glade is, is as large as some of those get um, versus in Southwest <laughs> Missouri near the town of Ava, some of the glades are over a hundred acres in size. And, um, but for those, yeah, it depends on the, the type of bedrock, but for those sandstone glades, um, a quarter acre would be kind of the minimum size. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Terry, um, probably for Susan. Uh, what is the impact of prescribed burns on winter creeper? And does <laughs> fire eliminate winter creeper in a woodland or prairie? Good question. Most invasive exotics, unfortunately, are not particularly harmed by fire. The majority of them are um, top killed and then re-sprout. I have not had any personal experience burning winter cre creeper. Have you, Mike, seen that? No? No, I haven't. Um... I, I suspect it would be, reason it, at the very minimum, it would be really helpful if you can get fire to carry through it. I suspect that would be a real problem. But if it you would. Can, if you can get the fire to carry through it, it would certainly make it easier to target it with foliar spraying after the fire. And that's how most invasives go with fire, that it'll be a one-two punch. The fire kind of knocks them back, but then you've still got to finish them off with either cutting and treating or spraying, foliar spraying. Um, and winter creeper is best sprayed in the spring when it's, when it's um, cuticles, it builds up a really waxy cuticle by the end of the summer seat and fall. So you want to get it early in spring when it's fresh green leaves are not very uh, protected yet. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Cynthia. If you want to harvest timber on your land, do you want a woodland or more of a forest habitat? You can harvest uh, some good timber in either one. I would, I would caution you in both cases probably not to do a really heavy harvest unless you're trying to do a complete regeneration cut for, um, you know, to to restart your forest entirely if that's something that interests you. But in a woodland, I would do a thinning. Um, certainly, you can do commercial harvest in either woodland or forest, and the best plan is to talk to a forester with uh, MDC um, or a consulting forester and get a management plan written for your property. They want to know, they'll want to know why you want to harvest, how what you're looking for, what your goals are. Are you doing it for the wildlife, for, um, for making money off of the trees that are there, et cetera. They'll want to learn what your reasons are, and then they'll help uh, make a plan that will make the most sense for your property. Yeah, I would I would second what Susan just said. Yeah, getting a professional forester, either a conservation department or a consulting forester would be really the important step just because there's so many variables um, in play. And if you don't, then you could be hiring a really bad forester who takes all the best and leaves you all the worst. And you want you want to leave some of the best trees to grow on. All right, thank you. And um, is it true that if you go through an MDC Forester, is that a free service? Yeah, I believe it is. Um, and we have cost share to pay for things like management plans through consulting foresters. So yeah, that, that sh it shouldn't cost you anything to do that. Okay, thank you. Another question from Matthew is, um, how long is the certification valid after completing the prescribed burn classes? Really good question. And I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. I should know that. I think it's good indefinitely. I don't remember hearing anything about having to attend refresher courses, but I'm not 100% sure. I can speak to this um, just because I have my level one certification with MDC and I do believe that you have to participate that, in a prescribed burn. I want to say it's every five years in order you're to- You're talking about level one with MDC staff, you mean? Or do you mean- why? Yes. That's different than this so-called okay. prescribed burn certification that's new. 
So okay. you're right for as MDC staff or or volunteers or whatever helping on an MDC. Right. Program, that's true for our plan, our uh, credentials. Okay. But I'm not positive about the the private land, the so-called prescribed burn cer- certified prescribed burn managers, what they call it or something. And I don't I don't know. Okay, thank you. And let's see, another question coming in from Janet. Um, she wanted to know if invasives should be removed before burning. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it kind of depends on the invasive. If it's autumn olive, absolutely. That one I have learned is you burn autumn olive that might be just scattered through your woodlands and it comes back like a monster. You know, one individual sprout is now 25 sprouts and it's just, and it spreads underground. The fire uh, encourages it to spread by underground rhizomes. So autumn olive, absolutely get it out of there before you burn it. Something like Japanese honeysuckle, I mean, fire is really good at setting it back a lot. So that would be fine to leave it and then burn it. Um, same with uh, bush honeysuckle, but if it's too much bush honeysuckle, you probably can't get a fire to carry through it. So you may have to get rid of some of that bush honeysuckle before you try to burn it. Um, Cerisia lespedeza is highly encouraged by fire. But again, if you burn it, you it's a good one-two punch and you can spray it after the when it comes back after the burn and you've used up some of the seed bank, which is good. So I would say there's a few... Um, Trees that trees or brush shrubs or trees that spread by rhizome by underground roots that those should be addressed before a burn, but the rest you can probably burn and then go go in and treat. Makes it easier to find them to treat afterwards. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Mary Jo: Is there a safe way to burn years old slash in a forest that was logged many years ago, or should it just be left? The safe way to burn a slash pile, if it'll burn, is to burn it in the middle of winter when there's snow on the ground with a big, you know, with a drip torch and some, uh, you know, a mixture of diesel fuel and gas, a safe mixture that will get it going and <laughs> burn it up when there's snow all around. That's the safe way to burn a big old slash pile. Um, or if it, I mean, it depends if it's not in a burn unit, certainly just leaving it as habitat for rabbits and other things is fine too. Okay. Great. And um, let's see. So this is from Matthew and he had, he said he had a contractor perform a TSI two years ago on 20 acres of woods. Um, the contractors were armed with Tordon. Uh-oh. And <laughs> left me with the impression that it was the herbicide of choice for that application. Yeah. Um. However, you mentioning the the risks with using Tordon, um, could you could you um, touch on those again uh, in terms of what Tordon could potentially do? So Tordon is very effective, very cheap, easy to come by, and that's why it's the herbicide of choice. And it comes in this little applicator bottle that you just squirted out from it. So it's just easy. And that's easily accessible to found in any store and easy to apply. And that's why everybody uses it. Um, in some circumstances, it would work fine. Like if you were trying to remove woodies from an old pasture and you're trying to you know just or you're trying to kill autumn olive in an old pasture that might be fine um, but if you're working in a woodland setting and you're trying to like he said doing a tsi it hopefully it was fine if they weren't over applying it and all hopefully it was fine but sometimes it does travel from root to root you know trees connect underground through mycorrhizae or even by touching the in you know directly and sometimes it moves through the soil or through the roots to affect other species, other trees that you don't want it to affect. So that's my caution about that particular uh, herbicide. Thank you for that. Um, this is a question that I think probably a lot of people have, including myself. So uh, Richard wants to know, Does uh, do significant populations of insects, reptiles, animals, and so on perish during a prescribed burn. That's always that, that, that oh. depends on a lot of factors. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
especially the season of burn that Susan was mentioning and the phenology of the burn. So if it's a, if it's done, of course, during the winter time, there are always going to be some invertebrates in the leaf litter that are going to, going to perish okay. with any burn, but the result of an increase in invertebrates with the response of those flowering plants is going to offset the ones that are perishing in the leaf litter. Um, but spring burns that are, that are too late with the phenology, when the leaves are out, when box turtles are out moving, are going to do um, quite a bit of damage. So typically burns after after the 1st of April are not great, but that doesn't, it depends, and Susan can chime in on this, it depends on the year in the spring, because there are slow springs where burning even until early May can be uh, can be okay, but that's typical. That's untypical, especially yeah, early. Early May might be northern Missouri. I mean, you also yeah, have to it's, take it's in pretically, geography. But typically, and typically, yeah, by the end of March yeah. is when we typically want burns to end because of those impacts. <laughs> Absolutely, and and every year is different. You know, we did a burn one year on March the twenty sixth, and yet everything was leafing out it was it was way later than i was normally comfortable with i mean normally i'm okay with march 26 it's pushing my 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 comfort level but on that particular year we were way ahead of schedule and everything was leafing out the interesting thing was that that was a milder burn than i'd ever seen because so many of the trees had already started to leaf out they created enough humidity that the conditions for the burn were actually quite mild um, that at least gives things a chance to escape. They always say that for like, well, turtles are always slow, but turtles hopefully can, if, if they are out, um, if the fire isn't real quick, they can find some kind of refugia getting, you know, under logs and, and, you know, getting out of the way if it's not a raging fire coming toward them. Um, but still turtles, once the turtles are out, I'm, I'm definitely not fond of burning anymore. Um, snakes are another big consideration, and they say that once snakes really wake up and get moving, that they can move pretty darn fast and get out of the way. The biggest danger is when they're first waking up and they've come out of their hibernaculum, but they're kind of slow and sluggish, and so that's something we need to try to take into consideration, and we, um, we don't want to kill anything, but as Mike said, sometimes a few things die for the greater good of, of a much better habitat for all the animals, and they will get repopulated from things nearby. But the rarest and best we need to watch out the most for. All right, thank you. Um, Robert would like to know if black walnuts belong in the upland areas with the post uh, or white oaks. That's one that you didn't mention. You want to take that one, Mike? Sure. Well, yeah, there are occasions where you'll get a few walnuts in kind of weird upland places. And the walnuts typically like a little more calcium in the soil. So they're not going to be in areas that are super acidic with blueberries and other um, acidic tolerant plants, but you'll find in some of these upland areas where the, the soil is developed from limestone and dolomite, you'll get an occasional walnut growing on a dry site. It's not doing great, but they will occasionally grow in those those cases. So yeah, it, they're not, you know, it, it's kind of just a, an anomaly that happens once in a while. Is it more common, Mike, in the up, uplands of northern Missouri? Where it the is, for are a little sure. deeper than down yeah. here in the Ozarks. And, and with better soil, you see that pretty, mm -hmm. not, it's not uncommon north of the Missouri River. And actually, the walnuts, when they're more mature, are with the, have thick bark and are actually fairly fire tolerant to, mm -hmm. to low intensity fires. Okay, thank you. Um, just as a note, Stacy uh, made a comment that she and her husband completed the fire class training that we talked about, and she said there was no mention on of renewals. So just that's what I thought. Yeah. So let's see, and another question. Oh, Sorry, that was my alarm to close to close my chicken coop. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good thing to have. Um, <laughs> 
David would like for you to comment um, on the response of invasive shrubs to thinning and burning. So, yeah, that was what we, to thinning and burn, it's even either thinning or burning. If you have invasive shrubs, especially autumn olive or, you know, some of the trees like tree of heaven and that sort of thing, you really want to address those before you start opening things up. Um, I've seen some of our managers uh, take cedars out of some of our bottoms just because they were looking for something for the crews to do that day. And they said, oh, there's some cedars. Why don't you go cut those cedars out of the bottoms? The only problem was the bottoms had bush honeysuckle and autumn olive in them. And so the cedars were preferable and were shading out the bush honeysuckle and the autumn olive. And when we take the cedars out and bring more sunlight to the ground, we encouraged those, those uh, shrubs. And like I said before, with the fire, um, it fire will hem back. It'll just top kill them. It's okay for bush honeysuckle. It'll top kill it and give you a chance to get in there and get after it maybe. Um, but it's it's pretty awful for autumn olive. It just comes back with a vengeance. It's evil. All right. Thank you. Um, Let's see, another question coming, from, uh, this is a follow-up question, uh, follow up comment and question from Matthew. Um, he said that following that TSI um, management, the multi-flora rose went um, crazy and is now growing in places that it never did before. And um, will fire help with multi-flora rose? Yeah, it, it will definitely, hem it back, it will re-sprout right after the fire, but it will, it'll cut it back so that you can get in there and then foliar spray the, the, the re-sprouts as they come up. So it makes it easier to get in there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Joe was curious what conditions might cause a previously unburned woodland to struggle to burn despite having plenty of leaves in February. Uh, previously unburned, you said it hadn't been the first burn. Right. Um, so there's lots of leaf litter there, but there's probably also lots of shading. And that does make it harder to get the fire to carry through. If it's super shaded, it keeps the leaves moister and it and the and the humidity is held in, especially if it's heavy cedar shade. Um, so that just tends to make it a little tougher to get the fire to push through heavily heavily shaded or heavy, thick areas, areas that are super thick can be hard to get the first fire through. So you may have to do a little bit of thinning just to open it up just a little to let that fire get through. And that would, if you're gonna use fire, you wouldn't have to use any herbicide. You could just do a, a light thinning and then the fire should carry fine. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Stacy is, uh, She's been trying to tackle the TOH and cut about two foot above ground and sprayed herbicide on the stump. She's done this and so she can keep an eye on each TOH. Um, once she knew it was dead, will the stumps or small stems die off or will she need to burn those as well? All right. You're talking about Tree of Heaven, I'm assuming, TOH? I think, so. yeah, I wasn't, yeah. I was like, well, I'm hoping cutting. You. She's cutting and treating the stumps of Tree of Heaven. And uh -huh. that is actually, that is the one in exotic invasive tree that you should never cut and treat. Unfortunately, it is a monster. And when you cut and treat it, it, it doesn't kill it and it resprouts with a vengeance. So the best treatment, she's already done it. So now she's already seen the sprouts. Um, what she can do now is she has a couple choices. The best way to kill off Tree of Heaven is to either hack and squirt, which you use a little hatchet and you go around, if it's a big tree, you put in like five or six or eight hatchets around it every couple of inches or so. And you squirt herbicide just into the little cut. It's basically at waist high or so. Um, you're cutting into the cambium and putting herbicide into the cambium without cutting the whole tree. That prevents it from having that um, voracious uh, re-sprouting uh, that it does after you regularly just cut it and treat it. Um, so now that she's got lots of little ones, she can, if they're getting big enough, she could hack and squirt them. If, you know, just one hack per little tree, if they're not big enough and they're real small, like knee high or, you know, waist high, she could put, put on a backpack sprayer and foliar spray them in late summer, early fall 
um, or midsummer, anywhere from there on. Um, and that's actually very effective. I've learned the hard way. We we cut down some really big tree of heaven and created a monster, monster patch the size of a football field or more with humongous sprouts. And it was just awful. So, but we finally have that pretty well licked. Um, and I would probably do that before fire. Fire will also make it go crazy and, and, and re-sprout. Thank you. Um, let's see. Robert asks if you think that three years of consecutive burning might be hard on new perennial herbaceous plants getting established. New perennial plants as in he planted them or as in they just came up, I wonder. Are we talking in a woodland or are we talking in a prairie planting? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, um, if they're, I mean, if they are, I think they'd be okay, but I don't know if I would burn in the first year or so if I had just planted them. But once they get going, I think they're going to be all right. You know, Nature Conservancy burned you know, every single year in that one area and, and plants just kept thriving. So doing it, especially in the dormant season, it should be okay. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so Gail wanted to know about burning before the woodcock mates in January and February. And if they're in our woodland edge, can we burn a field um, near the woodland edge up through January without harming nests? Hey, Mike, can you speak to when they actually nest? I thought it was more like April, May when they're actually nesting like, or March at the earliest. Usually, I... yeah, they start. I thought it was late February when they do their. Well, they do their dance then. Yes. Their dance. And I'm assuming they're they're nesting after that dance yeah. in in March, I would think. I, I would think have it's to gotta be check. at least March, if not April. I know <laughs> I've stumbled yeah. across two little uh babies, adorable little fluffy just hatched out a few days or a week earlier. Um I stumbled upon those in May. So I don't know what their incubation period is. I don't know how long the eggs took to incubate. But I'm guessing that they don't actually, they, we see them, we see them doing their painting and their dancing anywhere from January through February. But I think a lot of that is territorial kind of establishing territories. And some of those, some of those birds actually keep migrating and go elsewhere to breed. Some right. of them stay here and breed, but I don't think they're breeding in February yet. So I think the adults would have no problem flushing and getting out of the way. Okay, thank you. Um, and just as a follow-up, Gail said that in her bottomland area, they dance in January and into late February, depending on the weather. Right. So, um, <clears throat> Dave wanted to know, um, does the quality and quantity of soil help determine whether an area will be a, a woodland or a glade? Uh, maybe Mike can answer this. Is yeah, it it's really the the well, it, it it has to do with the the bedrock geology and the landform and the soil depth. Um, so where you have shallow to bedrock soils with bedrock outcrops, it's where you get the glades. You know, typically less than a foot deep with open bedrock exposures. Um, and that's yeah there's a lot of variability there but having that shallow less than a foot depth of soil to bedrock is kind of the defining feature with with some outcrops of bedrock itself okay. and the soils on the soils on glades can vary so if, if it's on rhyolite the or sandstone or chert um the glade you know that that soil is very acidic very low nutrient soil but on a dolomite or limestone glade it's the opposite it's actually very rich um soil it's just very droughty soil okay thank you um let's see we have two more questions if you have time for those um one is from diane she would like to know how you would recommend getting rid of a black locust tree um 
I don't actually have much experience dealing with black locust. I know it's a tremendous sprouter. Um, if it's one big tree, she can try, you know, cutting and re uh, and treating it. If it's a bunch of them, I don't know if it acts like tree of heaven when you cut and treat it, but I don't think it's that vicious. So I think just having to cut and treat. But Mike, do you have any experience with black? I lady? know that folks in North Missouri have struggled with it in some places. Um, and I would have to ask. I know that it does involve. I don't think it's like tree of heaven in the sense that typically it's cut, it's cut and treat. But I don't know if triclopper. Triclopyr. Triclopyr is, is the recommended herbicide or not. They, I think they have used a different a different combination before. Um, it is difficult to control. And if it's in an open enough area or away from good things, then Tordon would probably work. You could, right. yeah, as yeah. As and it's sometimes it's in old fields, but other times it's it can be, you know, and usually, you know, it's an area where people planted it in old field, but then it can spread to higher quality sites nearby. All right, thank you. And um, the last question is, from Mary Jo, this is a follow-up question. Can you use a torch to kill a cut stump invasive? Mm, so I don't think so because you'd have to, I mean, if you put a propane torch on a cut stump, you might burn it up, but that's not necessarily going to burn the root crown. I don't know. You, it's, I don't know. That's a good question. I, it, I kind of doubt it because fire itself just top kills these things and then they come back. But, you know, could you in the middle of a snowy day when it's perfectly safe, sit there and blast it with, you know, a flamethrower where you were torching it for five, 10 minutes? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you maybe do, but I, it would be very inefficient. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, in addition to the questions, there are lots of well wishes from everyone in attendance, uh, thanking you for your great presentation and wishing um, everyone a happy holiday. So um, I think that wraps it up for this uh, webinar. Thank you both so much for your time and expertise. Um, as mentioned before, this webinar is being recorded and an email will be sent out on Monday with the webinar link and other helpful resources. And if you enjoyed this presentation, we hope that you'll join us for our next webinar on December 6th. It's entitled Honduras, a natural haven for migratory birds with William Ariana. So thank you both so much and thank all of our folks who tuned in tonight and have a great evening. And happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>